Hey everybody, I am John Hodgins. I'm an Associate Director for Strategic Communications at the Annie E. Casey Foundation, and I'm honored to support the Foundation's work on youth mental health. Um, I wanna start with a few housekeeping items. Uh, we are leaving time for Q&As at the end of this, so please enter your questions into Zoom's Q&A feature, not the main chat room. Our presenter today will not be able to monitor the chat yeah. during her talk, so the Q&A feature is the best way to raise your questions. The session is being recorded, and we'll follow up with an email to let you know when it's live on the Casey website. We'll also share any relevant links that are shared during today's talk. And a reminder, the best way to stay up to date on Casey resources is to subscribe to our newsletter at www.aecf.org newsletters. This webinar series on youth mental health is an outreach of a national summit the Casey Foundation hosted last April in Atlanta, Georgia. Many participants asked for more information about preventing youth mental health concerns and in better understanding the role of adverse childhood experiences. To answer your questions, we've brought in one of the best. Today, I'm thrilled to introduce one of the summit's attendees, Phyllis Holditch Anilin, PhD, who is leading today's webinar. She is the Senior Advisor for Adverse Childhood Experiences in the Director's Office for the Division of Violence Prevention within the CDC's National Center for Injury Prevention and Control. I have to imagine that that's a very full business card. In this role, she coordinates work relating to the prevention of ACEs and collaborates with both internal and external partners on advancing the field of ACEs prevention and response. Welcome, Dr. Holditch Nyland. Take it away. Great. Thank you, John. And hello, everyone. I'm so glad to be here with you today and talk to you um, kind of briefly about our work in preventing adverse childhood experiences um, here at the CDC. So I know you're all here because of your interest in ACEs, so you probably don't need to review what ACEs are, but I do want to take a minute to share how we at CDC are thinking about ACEs and about positive childhood experiences or PCEs, which we'll talk a little bit more about in a minute. At CDC, we define adverse childhood experiences or ACEs as potentially traumatic events that occur in childhood, which we define as ages birth to 17. And these include things like experiencing or witnessing violence and experiencing neglect, both physical and emotional. But also included are aspects of the child's environment that could undermine their sense of safety, stability, and bonding, such as growing up in a household with substance use, mental health problems, or parental separation or incarceration. The traditional ACEs, um, which appear on the left-hand side of the screen, were measured in the original CDC Kaiser ACEs study from 1995 to 1997. These traditional ACEs um, include physical, emotional, and sexual abuse, physical and emotional neglect, and these specific household challenges that I just mentioned. Although the original ACEs study and many of our core kind of ACEs measures include these traditional ACEs, these are not the only types of traumatic experiences that can occur in childhood. Our Division of Violence Prevention and leaders in the ACEs scientific community have acknowledged the importance of expanding our view of ACEs to include experiences like those listed on the right hand side of the screen. These expanded ACEs include, but are certainly not limited to, experiencing discrimination, witnessing community violence, experiencing other forms of violence outside of traditional definitions of child abuse, and experiencing trauma related to safety and stability like housing insecurity or homelessness, food insecurity, or living in extreme poverty. We know that ACEs have a dose response relationship with a whole host of lifetime health outcomes that span all of these domains and more. That means that the more ACEs a person experiences in childhood, the greater their risk for developing all of these outcomes than someone who has no ACEs or who has experienced fewer ACEs. We used to focus more on the behavioral risk factors as pathways for all of these relationships to outcomes like a person with more ACEs might be more likely to smoke and abuse al alcohol, and that could explain their increased risk for cancer. But what we are learning about how trauma and toxic stress affect the developing brain in childhood is re revealing that much of the impact of ACEs on mental, physical, and behavioral health across the lifespan can be explained by the effects of ACEs on brain development, the endocrine system, the immune system, and even gene expression. We also know that health inequities and social determinants of health play a critical role in risk for experiencing ACEs, 
and for exacerbating the effects of ACEs. This slide presents work from Wendy Ellis and her colleagues and depicts what they have termed the pair of ACEs. The tree and the leaves above ground represent the ACEs experiences themselves, but the roots and the soil of the tree contain adverse community environments, inequities such as racism, poverty, inequitable economic opportunity, et cetera. These community environments can increase risk for ACEs and make their impacts on health more pronounced when they happen. Another important player in the relationship between ACEs, health inequities, and lifelong health outcomes are positive childhood experiences, or PCEs. The research on PCEs and how they directly affect health and may interact with ACEs is really still emerging, but we feel that learning more about PCEs and how we can leverage them to prevent ACEs mitigate their impacts and improve health is critical to ensuring that all children have access to safe, stable, nurturing relationships and environments. This graphic depicts the different ways that PCEs can have impacts on multiple physical, mental, and behavioral health outcomes, as well as life opportunities. At the bottom, we see that PCEs can have a direct and positive impact on health outcomes. At the top, we see a path of preventing ACEs, Evidence is emerging that the presence of PCEs can prevent ACEs from happening in the first place, thereby having a positive impact on health outcomes. Finally, the middle path is one of mitigation. Evidence suggests, and I'll talk about a study in just a minute that shows this, that the presence of PCEs can mitigate the negative effects of ACEs on health outcomes, even among those who have already experienced ACEs. Here on this slide, we see some of the examples of direct effects of PCEs on important health outcomes. And then as I mentioned, um, this is the study where evidence is emerging on the mitigation effects of PCEs. So these results suggest that even when, even when people report having high PCEs, even if they have also experienced ACEs, their risk of reporting depression and mental health problems is similar to those who have no ACEs. As you can see, the risk is highest among the people who have high numbers of ACEs and low numbers of PCEs, only zero to two PCEs. Because of this, preventing ACEs is a CDC priority. It's one of the top three priorities for the Injury Center. Our goal is to create and sustain sta safe, stable, nurturing relationships and environments for all children and families and helping all children reach their full health and life potential. The next few slides um, depict our vital signs on ACEs that was published in 2019. This vital signs was based on a study of the behavioral risk factor surveillance system, data from 25 states that included their ACEs module on their BRFSS for the years 2015 to 2017. So this uh, is a survey that asks adults um, about all sorts of health and health risk behaviors, um, but they also, if they include the ACEs module, asked um, these adults about their retrospective experiences of ACEs in childhood. And the point of this study was to estimate the long-term health and social outcomes in adults that contribute to leading causes of illness and death and reduced access to life opportunities. We know from this study that ACEs are common, roughly 62% of adults report at least one ACE and 16% or roughly one in six report having experienced four or more ACEs. We know, as I mentioned before, that the accumulation of ACEs is linked to much higher risk of many physical, mental, and behavioral health outcomes and other life opportunities that you'll see on this slide. This study found that preventing ACEs has the potential to reduce these leading causes of death, such as heart disease, cancer, respiratory disease, and diabetes. You'll see that that preventing ACEs could also um, impact health risk behaviors and life opportunities. Said slightly differently, this study showed that preventing ACEs could have reduced the number of adults with depression by as much as 44% or up to 21 million avoided cases of depression using 2017 national estimates. 
Similarly, preventing ACEs could have reduced the number of adults who had heart disease by up to 1.9 million avoided cases, or those who were overweight or obese by up to 2.5 million cases, according to 2017 national estimates. So as you can see, um, it's very important to us to apply what we know from the evidence about how to prevent ACEs and promote positive childhood experiences. This is um, a slide that depicts our resources for action. Um, these are um, publications put out for, um, for states and communities who want to prevent these different forms of violence based on the best of available evidence. Our knowledge about the best available evidence is summarized in these resources. Um, this depicts the whole suite of, um, of prevention resources. You'll see the preventing adverse childhood experiences one um, is in the middle on the bottom row. And these, again, help states and communities take advantage of the best available evidence to prevent violence, including many types of violence and social and economic and other exposures in the home and community that adversely affect children. The Preventing ACEs resource tool identifies six strategies that can prevent ACEs from happening in the first place, as well as strategies to mitigate the harms of ACEs. Each strategy contains specific approaches that can advance the strategy and evidence-based programs, policies, and practices that are examples of each approach. It's important to note that not all effective programs are housed here, but, but examples are given for each approach. Um, you can see the strategies here, and then I'm going to run through the strategies and their approaches on the next few slides. Strengthening economic supports for families is the first strategy, and this is a multi-generation strategy that addresses the needs of parents and children so that both can succeed and achieve lifelong health and well-being. Strong evidence consistently links low income to ACE exposures and children's long-term health, educational, and social outcomes. About four in 10 children under the age of the United States live in a low-income household, including more than half of African-American and Hispanic children. Nearly one in 10 children in the U.S. live in deep poverty. Addressing the social and economic underpinnings of ACEs is critical to achieving lasting and sustainable effects. Research shows that parents who are facing financial hardship are more likely to experience stress, depression, and conflict in their relationships and family, all of which can compromise parenting and increase the risk of violence and other ACEs. Therefore, policies that strengthen household financial security are the first approach under this strategy. These include things like tax credits, childcare subsidies, and other forms of temporary assistance assistance, excuse me, and livable wages that can prevent ACEs by increasing economic stability and family income to help parents meet children's basic needs around food, shelter, and medical care and obtain high quality childcare. The earned income tax credit, for example, has been shown to lift families out of poverty and has demonstrated impacts on infant mortality, health insurance coverage, school performance, maternal stress, and mental health problems. Parents who receive child care subsidies tend to access higher quality child care, which increases the likelihood that children will experience safe, stable, nurturing relationships and environments. Access to affordable child care also reduces parental stress and maternal depression, which are risk factors for child abuse and neglect and other risk behaviors associated with ACEs. Family-friendly work policies can also prevent ACEs, and they are the second approach under this strategy. Paid leave can help protect families from losing income related to welcoming a new child or to care for a sick child or family member. Flexible and consistent work schedules provide parents with a predictable pattern of work, which makes it easier to access quality childcare. Research suggests that women who receive paid maternity leave are more likely to maintain their current employment and that access to paid leave may be protective against depression, pediatric abusive head trauma, and against intimate partner violence or IPV, which is another ACE exposure. 
Across the board, strengthening economic supports can reduce child behavior problems such as aggression, anxiety, and hyperactivity, which are linked to later perpetration of violence towards peers and intimate partners and result in better development of outcomes in children and youth. The second strategy centers around changing social norms that accept or allow indifference to violence and adversity. On this slide, you'll see the first two approaches under this strategy. Public education campaigns are one way to shift social norms and reframe the way people think and talk about ACEs and who is responsible for preventing them. They can also help shift the narrative away from individual responsibility to one that engages the community and draws upon multiple solutions to promote safe, stable, nurturing relationships and environments for all children. Research suggests that public education campaigns to help parents understand the cycle of abuse and campaigns specifically targeting child physical abuse can positively impact parenting practices, reduce children's exposure to parental anger and conflict, and reduce child behavior problems. Legislative approaches to reduce corporal punishment can help establish norms around safer, more effective discipline strategies to reduce the harms of harsh physical punishment particularly if they are compared with public education campaigns. Legislative approaches to reducing corporal punishment are associated with decreases in support of and use of harsh physical punishment as a child discipline technique. Experiencing harsh physical punishment as a child increases the risk for involvement in crime and violence in adolescence and later perpetration of violence towards a partner or one's own children experiencing harsh, phys harsh physical punishment, sorry, that's a tongue twister for me today, as a child is also associated with mental health problems, lower academic performance, and lower self-esteem. So the next two approaches uh, under this strategy are on this slide. Bystander approaches and efforts to mobilize men and boys as allies and prevention can be used to change social norms in ways that support healthy relationship behaviors. Such approaches work by fostering healthy norms around gender and violence with the goal of spreading these social norms through peer networks. They also work by teaching young people skills to safely intervene when they see behavior that puts others at risk and reinforcing social norms that reduce their own risk for future perpetration. Green Dot and Coaching Boys into Men are two examples of these types of programs. Bystander approaches and efforts to mobilize men and boys as allies in prevention are associated with reductions in teen dating violence, negative bystander behaviors, and sexual violence, victimization, and perpetration. The next strategy focuses on ensuring a strong start for children and paving the way for them to reach their full life potential. The early years are critical for healthy brain development and physical, emotional, social, behavioral, and intellectual capacities that can affect children across the lifespan. The first approach for this strategy is early childhood visitation programs, such as Healthy Families America and Nurse Family Partnership. These programs can prevent ACEs by providing information, caregiver support, and training about child health, development, and care to families in their homes with the goal of building safe, stable, nurturing relationships and home environments. These programs have been shown to reduce child abuse and neglect and to improve outcomes for children and parents. Long-term follow-up of the Nurse Family Partnership Program found effects into adolescence and adulthood for the children in their program, including fewer behavior problems, higher academic achievement, lower rates of substance use, and fewer arrests by age 19. Research suggests that access to affordable, high-quality childcare can reduce child behavior problems, parental stress and depression, and rates of child abuse and neglect. And it's the next approach under this strategy. Difficulties finding quality childcare, for instance, have been linked to self-reported child neglect among mothers with substance use problems. Access to affordable, high-quality childcare may also reduce child abuse deaths that are associated with having to leave children at home in the care of unrelated adults. Preschool enrichment with family engagement programs are the final approach under this strategy. And they provide high-quality early childhood education and support to economically disadvantaged families to build a strong foundation for children's future, 
learning and healthy development and lowers risk for future academic and behavioral problems. Program content and delivery vary based on the model used and can include home visits, connections to community supports, and half to full day childcare and school programs. Parental involvement is emphasized as critical in the child's development and in increasing children's success in school. Children who participate in these programs show better academic outcomes like better math, language, and social skills, lower grade retention, and higher likelihood of graduating from college. They demonstrate better mental health outcomes like lower rates of depression and substance use and have lower child maltreatment outcomes like lower rates of substantiated cases of child abuse and neglect and fewer out of home placements. The next strategy is teaching skills. Programs that teach skills to help parents and youth handle stress, manage emotions, foster healthy relationships and tackle everyday challenges of life is an important part of a comprehensive approach to preventing ACEs. Social emotional learning approaches often taught in elementary school are widely used in the U.S. to enhance interpersonal skills. They teach students skills for communication, problem solving, alcohol and drug resistance, conflict management, empathy, coping, and emotional awareness and regulation. Systematic reviews of these programs find that they significantly reduce peer violence, substance use, depression and anxiety, suicidal thoughts and attempts, delinquency, and involvement in crime. They are associated with improvements in reading, writing, and math proficiency. These programs can both potentially mitigate the consequences of ACEs among those who have already experienced them and prevent ACEs in adolescents and prevent ACEs in the next generation. Programs like CDC's Dating Matters, Safe Dates, and Fourth R teach healthy relationship skills, including social emotional learning skills to adolescents. They have been shown to significantly reduce teen dating violence perpetration and victimization, which are ACEs, and put kids at risk for intimate partner violence in their adult relationships. These programs have also been shown to reduce peer violence, weapon carrying, and substance use. The final approach under teaching skills is parenting and family relationship approaches. These programs cover developmentally appropriate expectations for child behavior and teach parents behavior management, parental monitoring, problem solving skills, safe and effective discipline, healthy relationship behaviors, and effective and supportive parent-child communication. These programs have shown reductions in child behavior problems, youth substance use, including prescription opioid misuse, youth physical fighting, delinquency and arrests, early onset of sexual behavior and high risk sexual behaviors and reductions in parental stress and depression. These programs have also been shown to lead to improvements in parent-child communication, parental involvement and support of youth, parenting practices such as discipline, monitoring and supervision. The next strategy is about connecting youth to caring adults and productive after-school activities. These connections are important for both preventing ACEs and for buffering against the impact of ACEs for those who've already experienced them. Mentoring programs are the first approach under this strategy, and they're one way to connect youth to caring adults outside the family, which is a demonstrated protective experience or positive childhood experience. These programs pair youth with an adult volunteer with the goal of fostering a relationship that will contribute to the young person's growth opportunities, skill development, academic success, and future schooling and employment outcomes. There are many mentoring programs, but Big Brothers Big Sisters is the oldest and best known example. Youth who participate are less likely to skip classes and school, less likely to initiate drug and alcohol use, and less likely to engage in fighting. They show improvements in academic performance, parent-child relationships, and student-teacher relationships, as well as parental trust. After-school programs and activities also provide opportunities for youth to strengthen their behavioral, leadership, and academic skills, and to be involved in positive activities after school. One example is After School Matters, which offers high school students apprenticeship opportunities in technology, science, communication, sports, and the arts. 
students show improvements in attitudes towards school and graduation rates and reductions in academic failure and engagement in delinquent risk behaviors like gang activity and drug sales. The last strategy focuses on timely access to intervention and effective care, support, and treatment for children and families in which ACEs have already occurred to help mitigate the health and behavioral consequences of ACEs that we talked about earlier, strengthen children's resist resilience, and break the cycle of adversity. Primary care settings offer a unique opportunity to identify and address ACEs exposures, as well as other issues within the family that serve as risk factors for ACEs, such as parental depression, substance use, major stress, use of harsh punishment, and intimate partner violence. One example is Safe Environments for Every Kid, or the SEEK program, which helps providers ask about ACEs exposures in the family environment and then refers families and children to appropriate services. This program has demonstrated reduced reports to Child Protective Services, reduced use of harsh physical punishment and reductions in maternal intimate partner violence. It's also demonstrated effects on better medical care for kids, including adherence to medical care recommendations and more timely vaccinations. Finally, it has demonstrated improvements among providers in addressing depression, substance misuse, or intimate partner violence, and serious parental stress. For children and adult survivors of violence, victim-centered services can be both life-saving and helpful in reducing the harms of violence. Women receiving victim-centered services report less abuse from former intimate partners, less depression, decreased feelings of distress, and overall improvements in self-esteem, safety, and well-being, outcomes that help to ensure safe, stable, nurturing relationships and environments for their children. Many victims of partner violence have a history of ACEs. Victim-centered services in this regard also help women cope with their own history of ACEs and access support. Therapeutic treatments are, that are trauma-informed can be used to address depression, fear, and anxiety, and post-traumatic stress disorder, problems adjusting to school, work, or daily life, and other symptoms of trauma and distress in children. Trauma-focused cognitive ther behavioral therapy, or trauma-focused CBT, is one example that is highlighted across several of these um, resources for action that is effective in reducing these symptoms as well as behavioral problems. It's also been shown to strengthen positive parenting skills. Another is cognitive behavioral intervention for trauma in schools, which addresses the stigma and access barriers to individual treatment by being offered in schools. It's associated with improvement in symptoms of PTSD and depression and parent reported behavior problems. Children with a history of ACE exposures are at increased risk of becoming involved in crime and violence, using alcohol or drugs, or engaging in other health compromising behaviors. Effective treatments for kids who are demonstrating some of these risk, factor, risk factors, such as multi-systemic therapy or MST, have demonstrated both short and long-term benefits in reducing these risks and strengthening protective factors. MST, for example, effectively reduces rates of arrest for violent felonies and other crime, problematic sexual behavior, and out-of-home placements. MST has also demonstrated beneficial impacts on family functioning, parenting practices, youth substance use, peer relations, academic performance, mental health, involvement in gangs, and sibling criminal behavior. And then the final, final approach under this strategy is family-centered treatment approaches for substance use disorders. These may be used to simultaneously address substance misuse by parents and the needs of their children with this specific ACE exposure. These approaches utilize integrated program models that combine evidence-based treatments for substance use disorders with a range of preventive services like mental health services, parenting education and training, medical and nutrition services, education and employment assistance, child care, children's services, and aftercare. These services benefit both children and their parents and pairs effective parenting interventions with substance use treatment. This has benefits that go beyond substance use treatment alone. Pro programs may be delivered in residential or outpatient settings. 
Integrated programs are associated with improvements in child development and emotional and behavioral functioning. They're also associated with positive impacts on maternal mental health, birth outcomes, parent-child attachment, and positive parenting behaviors. So that was a ton of information for you all about um, the strategies and approaches that are included in our um, Preventing ACEs resource for action. Um, I wanna turn your attention now to this violence prevention and practice tool, which can be found on our Veto Violence website and the web address is here on the slide. Um, and this is really an interactive tool to help um, states and communities who are wanting to implement um, these strategies and approaches to address ACEs and perhaps to address other forms of violence in doing their planning, establishing their partnerships, um, hearing success stories, getting um, getting instructions on how to adapt some of these strategies and approaches um, if necessary, and sort of which particular strategies and approach it, approaches are um, demonstrated effective at preventing different forms of violence. If you knew that you wanted to address ACEs and youth violence, uh, for instance. There's also helpful information about um, implementation, strategies and science and evaluation. Um, also on our Veto Violence website are um, our ACEs specific trainings, um, which may do a better job of talking about um, ACEs and, and helping you learn about ACEs um, than I have even done on this webinar today. But they're also great um, for people to share with their communities and others that they're trying to partner with and, and understanding the importance of addressing ACEs and promoting positive childhood experiences. So the, the training that's at the top there um, is just for general audiences. It's just a general training on adverse childhood experiences um, and gives an overview and some of these um, the evidence around uh, effects on life, lifelong health that we've talked about today. Um, and then the four trainings underneath that are profession specific trainings that we've developed in collaboration with other organizations. Um, there is one for, um, for mental health providers that we worked with the um, with American Psychological Association on. There's one for pediatric healthcare providers that we worked with um, American Medical Association on. And then the, um, the bottom two have just very recently been released. They are for um, educators and everybody working in sort of the, educate, the education space for, for children, not just teachers, but also administrators and librarians and everybody who works in, in a school or educational setting. Um, and then the final one is about um, preventing childhood, preventing adverse childhood experiences for um, leaders and those who work in faith organizations. So I wanted to post, point those out as well. Those are available um, for you to access on our Veto Violence website as well. Um, and then I briefly wanted to mention our Essentials for Childhood Preventing Adverse Childhood Experiences through Data to Action um, funding announcement. So we just have um, solicited applications at the beginning of last year and announced um, 12 different recipients for um, this funding announcement. And this builds upon um, two previous funding announcements that we had. One is the Essentials for Childhood funding, and the second one is the Preventing ACEs Data to Action funding. Um, this combines both of those lines of funding and asks recipients to um, collect ACEs and PCEs data from youth in order to build their data kind of infrastructure around ACEs and PCEs. Um, they're asked to implement two of the primary prevention strategies from our um, ACEs resource for action that I just um, talked about and to build partnerships with others doing this work to build sustainability. Um, and then pending the availability of funding, this will be a five-year funding announcement. Um, these are the 12 recipients um, that have been funded under this new uh, NOFO. 11 recipients represent states and one um, is Chickasaw Nation and represents a tribal nation. So I just wanted to present this in case, um, in case you all are from any of these areas and want to get in touch with the folks who are um, funded to do this work in your area. Um, 
So we, we know a lot about how to prevent ACEs and promote positive uh, childhood experiences, but I did want to mention that we also recently have developed and published our first ever um, research research priorities for ACEs. Um, these all are sort of focused within um, a health equity lens um, so that all of these questions are helping us understand, better understand how to uh, assess and understand ACEs and prevent them with an eye to, uh, with an eye to health equity and, and really addressing kind of the, the social um, underpinnings of, of some of these risks for ACEs. Um, this shows the three areas that we focus on in our research priorities. Um, one is around concept, definition, and measurement. We are currently working within the Division of Violence Prevention um, on developing a, unif a uniform set of definitions for both ACEs and positive childhood experiences. Um, that's based on a whole host of expert convenings and expert input, as well as a deep literature review. So we're um, we're working on that now and hopefully will be published at the end of this year or beginning of next year. We want to better understand the risk and protective factors for ACEs um, and for promoting PCEs and better understand the risk and protective factors at the outer levels of the social ecology, so the community and societal levels, um, since we already know some about the risk and protective factors at the individual and family level. Um, and then finally, the um, we need better research on prevention, intervention, identification, and response. Um, and you'll see the double-sided arrows that show that all of these areas of research inquiry inform one another. Um, this is a screenshot from our um, from our infographic on ACEs, which is also available on our Veto Violence website, um, and you can use it to talk with your partners and those um, who are interested in doing this ACEs work. Um, the infographic um, provides information and follows a child as she or he grows up and becomes a parent about how we can provide uh, pr and promote well-being for all children and their families. And then I think I am okay on time. Um, and um, I will say, oh, I actually, I have time. I'm going to um, produce, I'm going to show one video as long as the, um, the sound is working um, that our communications team developed. And this really focuses on some of those protective factors at the, at the community level um, that can change a child's trajectory. Trajectory. So I'm going to scoot to that before we get to questions. Um, it's just a short video, and y'all can let me know if the sound works. Can you all hear that? My future yesterday could have looked another way. No view from this podium from where I share my past today. My neighborhood could have stood vacant, lots abandoned. No ground for play, sidewalks, parks. Bored by day and after dark, nervous, leaving our houses. My babysitters might have been cold cereal and TV friends. With bills to pay, no living wage, mom works two jobs, leaves us to stay alone. With the struggles private, don't know whether it's public help. My family's future would have remained marked by my sister's illness. Medical bills, financial strain, seeing my parents fight, hearing their raised voices, unassured and afraid, it's tough to make choices. But my future yesterday did not become a tale of caution. I rose above because you saw your future in me. Our community became extended family opening doors when my parents needed more. They found people to help and local resources. Our home visitor taught us skills to manage stressful situations, like my sister's sickness, and connected our family with health services. Our outside supports built inside stability. Dad's new skills and found job led to shared kitchen creativity. Full hearts and full bellies, priceless conversations. Mom working one job eased our situation. 
Our community planted pride in me. These hands harvested food, fed families. Greening our community means people garden and see neighbors, friends, outdoors. Today, I stand before you because yesterday, you stood behind me. My future yesterday is our celebration today and our stronger tomorrow. The story you've just seen represents more than one person's experiences. We've only highlighted three of the many ways in which you can help stop adverse childhood experiences before they start. Everyone plays a role. You can too. Learn how to create positive relationships and environments for all children in your community. Visit vetoviolence.cdc.gov. All right, um, so now I think we can, um, I can stop sharing and we can um, open it up for questions. Hey everybody, um, I have two quick observations. Uh, one, we didn't lose any attendees during that presentation. Like that is very unusual that you've held everyone's attention and everybody was really engaged. And so, and that was really exciting to see. And secondly, um, I wanna say Dr. Nyland, that you have um, international influence because I saw in the group that we've got somebody from Japan and somebody from Canada on the call today. Great. So awesome. you, you, you've you gone international. <laughs> um, all right, so we've got a, a number of uh, great questions here. Um, the first one is um, from Amber. Um, you mentioned a lot of great programs. Um, how would somebody know what communities are using the programs and what outcomes data might be available on them? So the um, I would love for everybody who's interested in this presentation to download the um, Preventing ACEs Prevention Resource, and I can share again and flip back up to a um, QR code, I think, that will take you straight to all of CDC's, we used to call them technical packages, but now we've re reframed them and they're resources for action. Um, and those, as you mentioned, include examples of effective um, programs, policies, and practices, but it's not kind of a full clearinghouse of those. Um, other, other folks outside of CDC do have kind of like the blueprints, youth violence programs, lists of, of kind of any program that has met their, um, their qualifications for effectiveness, um, and those are available we um, we will have information, I think, up on our website soon about what our particular grantees are doing in terms of which strategies they've chosen to implement within their estates and communities um, and, and kind of what they're doing specifically to advance those strategies. Um, but I don't think we at CDC sort of have a comprehensive list of everyone in every community who's doing these different things. But the um, all the original citations for the programs and policies, et cetera, that are discussed in our prevention resource are housed within there. So you can go to those references and then get to the original sources um, on outcome data that, that show why they were included as examples in our prevention resource. It's a great question. Uh, we'll be sure to include links to those resources in an email that will follow up on this call. Uh, within the next few days, and I'll also have a link to this video. Um, we've recorded the session, and we'll provide uh, links to the file or the presentation file. Um, a question about the six um, strategies. You know, I think there's a lot of talk today about gun violence and community safety, and a lot of the presentation focused a little bit more, more on interpersonal violence in relationships. Um, where do you see community safety falling into the six strategies? I, um, we just have put out a new, um, or I think it's coming, but imminently a new um, kind of revamp of our youth violence uh, prevention or resource for action um, that focuses a little bit more on kind of community violence to try to expand the definition a little bit from the youth violence strategies. Um, and you'll see that there is a lot of overlap in the strategies that are among all of our, our violence resources for action. And that's because I think a lot of the kind of root causes and root 
risk factors for violence are similar across the different forms of violence. So um, I, I see them and I think everyone in the Division of Violence Prevention sees them as very connected. Um, we are we are starting to explore some areas kind of specific to the overlap between um, kind of safe storage and some other um, some other kind of firearm safety practices and ACEs uh, at CDC and um, and I I think that should be developing over time. We can talk more about that at a you know at a later time, kind of once we know a little bit more about what that intersection um, in terms of our work is going to look like. Um, but, but, you know, the, the strategies and approaches that I presented today are really focused on preventing ACEs and mitigating their consequences. But you will see if you look at all the different kind of resources for action that a lot of the strategies and approaches overlap, um, among all forms of violence, including community violence, um, because that they're effective at, at reducing all these kind of root causes, um, social inequities and, and basic like risk factors. Uh, thank that you. answers that um, question. It does. Uh, we've got a question from Gage, uh, which is a cool name. Um, with the COVID crisis creating a novel situation where most of youth's interactions took place online and some children have continued to struggle to regain social skills and connections, has there been discussion about the best ways to create and facilitate spaces to reach these young people? Sorry, will you repeat the last part of that question to create what? Um, has there been discussion about the best ways to create and facilitate spaces to reach these uh, young people? It's a great question. Um, we are certainly talking about it a lot at CDC. I don't know that we have um, all the answers. I do think that um, that all of our kids um, experienced kind of at different lengths across the country a real um, inter and, and across the world, um, real interruptions in their um, kind of in-person face-to-face interactions. And we know that that has um, affected mental health. It's affected emotion regulation and coping um, and all sorts of things. I think that um, that certainly when, when these things, when these troubles kind of develop into um, more severe mental health issues, a lot of the, the treatments, um, you know, if we think of of some of these um, voids in their in interpersonal interaction and development as as a potential trauma, many of the strategies and treatments that are listed in the last strategy um, in the ACEs prevention resource are good kind of places to start. Um, but I also think that that getting back to in person interaction and and having adults who are um, trauma informed and working with kids and sort of understanding the effects that that time um, of really reduced uh, in person and kind of peer interactions had on kids development um, is is really key to to starting that healing process for our for our children. Uh, thank you. Uh, we've got a question from a health professional. And they're wondering how to promote some of the strategies to families and youth involved in preventing ACEs. So that's a great question. I mean, a lot of these strategies, um, especially some at the more policy level, like supporting um, or economic supports for families are more for, you know, states and communities to implement. Um, but certainly um, there are a number of strategies that speak directly to um, to families and and um, educational, you know, schools and, and school systems of um, different strategies that can be implemented. So I think um, in some ways it's, it's trying to figure out um, your, your particular niche um, and some of those ACEs trainings that I referenced in the, in the veto violence um, website we don't have one yet. Um, I'm hoping this is coming in the future um, directly for parents, um, but certainly the general ACEs training is a great place to start for parents about sort of figuring out sort of their 
role it either in their community or, and within their own families for preventing ACEs um, and understanding their effects. And then um, their the profession specific ones as well. The, the educator one in particular has been really popular with, um, with lots of our um, school administrators and teachers and those who are working with schools about sort of everybody has a role to play um, in preventing ACEs. And we don't, we don't need to kind of put all the onus on well, it's up to parents to be better parents and then we'll prevent all the ACEs, right? I mean, community supports and these kind of outer level supports can really help help parents and families and communities um, ensure that, that kids have access to safe, stable, nurturing relationships and environments. Thank you. Um, we've got a question from uh, Shakira. And she's a youth success engagement counselor for a CDC nonprofit in an inner city community. Um, and she's noticing that a lot of the young people that she works with have multiple ACEs. Um, what are some recommendations on helping people come to terms with the realities of suffering from ACEs and how to empower them for a brighter future? That's a great question. Um, most of our strategies and our preventing ACEs resource focus on the primary prevention of ACEs, but many of them, um, certainly the last strategy, um, is all approaches that are for people who've already experienced ACEs and, and acknowledging the reality that we are not going to be able to prevent ACEs and have a world without ACEs kind of, even if we're successful at preventing ACEs starting today, we still have people who are who are dealing with those traumas. So all of the approaches that are within the last strategy, um, the different CBT and, um, and cognitive behavioral trauma informed care in schools, all of those approaches are ones that are really effective and demonstrated effective in, in helping people recover from their trauma. But we also know that some of the social emotional learning programs can help kids develop better emotion regulation and better um, empathy even after they've experienced the trauma of ACEs, which we know has biological effects on their, on their development of these skills. Um, connecting youth to parent, um, caring adults and activities, right, is another one that is prevents, prevents ACEs in adolescence, but also is a great way to mitigate the consequences of ACEs and improve PCEs or positive childhood experiences for kids who've already experienced them. And adults, certainly who've experienced ACEs and trauma, um, can benefit from, from different treatments and different activities to, to help them kind of cope with the effects that they're still feeling from their from their childhood traumas. Uh, great. Uh, we've got a question from uh, Pat in Iowa who is asking about the funding cycle for the, um, the grants that you were discussing. Um, will there be another round of funds available soon? And how do people learn more about that? So, um, well, I'll make sure that I include a link to the um, to our website that has information about those grants. The um, application process for those grants was early in 2023, and we just announced these new recipients um, in the fall of 2023. So they're just starting in their um, their cycle of five years of this funding. Um, if we see an increase in in our appropriation from Congress um, for ACEs then it's possible that additional funding could be available um, either within that five years or certainly we hope at the end of the five years to fund another, another cycle of these grants. Um, so it's all it's all pending availability of funding um, and we, we get our, our funding directly from Congress on ACEs, um, but hopefully that will continue to, to increase. We, we got our first appropriation from Congress specifically for ACEs in FY20. Um, so late 2019. So, so this is a, a relatively new funding line for CDC, um, and it's increased a little bit every year. And so we hope to continue to see that happen and so that we can fund more states and more communities to, um, to prevent ACEs and collect data on ACEs to better best understand where that burden sits within their state or community. Great. A uh, question from uh, Keith, and I love this one because it's about data. Um, in an ideal BRFSS data collection process, I'm, I don't know what that is, uh, would we be collecting <laughs> measures on both ACEs and PCEs? Um, I feel as though I've seen questions on one of the others from state data. 
Yes. So, um, so I, early in my presentation, I included a slide that was um, from um, a, a, a study that looked at a state that collected ACEs data, which is our, we support that ACEs module in the BRFSS. So if people be, that want to implement the ACEs questions on their behavioral risk factor surveillance system, I think is the last word. Um, I, I just say the acronym and forget what the, the letters mean. Um, but we are working right now at CDC in the hopes of trying to um, create a PCE module as well. Um, so the, the study was on um, a state that had the ACEs module and then they had added questions on PCEs to try to understand the inter interaction between ACEs and PCEs. But we're hoping um, in the future to be able to support to support states with funding um, to include PCE questions on their BRFSS as well, hopefully, as the ACES questions. And hopefully they'll do them both together so that we can continue to examine those, those mitigation effects. But that's a great question. And is PCE just another way to say short answer? Um, is PCE just another way to say protective factors? Is every protective factor or PCE? Or are is it is there like a technical thing there that differentiates them? So that's a great question. Um, they're all related, certainly, but but there are protective factors that can um, kind of exist at the broader like community or societal level that might not be considered necessarily an individual experience. So for ACEs, um, those are adverse childhood experiences, right? So it's it's not just necessarily like living in a community with higher than average rates of poverty. But it, it, but an experience might be food insecurity or housing insecurity, right? That's an individual experience yeah. versus a kind of ex larger level risk factor. So we think of positive childhood experiences in the same way. So an experience might be a kid having a, a, an adult outside the family who they can really trust and go to to talk about their feelings and problems, et cetera. Um, but then a broader um, protective factor that's related to that might be the presence of um, mentoring programs within the community, right? So, so that's a protective factor at the broader level, but not necessarily a positive childhood experience because it has to be experienced at the individual level to be considered a, a PCE, if that helps. <laughs> no, it does. Absolutely. Uh, we've got uh, several more questions, but we are out of time. So I'm just going to ask one last one. Okay. Um, what are the best solutions to sustain funding for violence prevention programs? Best solutions. Uh, um, I hope that, I don't know that I can say this, but as an individual okay. citizen and is not a scientist at CDC, um, I hope to see our, um, our government continue to fund um, and, and, prioritize violence prevention as a really important public health um, approach. And then also there are um, many, many, Annie EKC being one, amazing kind of foundations and non-governmental organizations and private foundations that do a lot of work to support um, violence prevention in very sustainable um, kind of long-term ways. So I hope that it's an intersection of, of both government and foundational and non-governmental nonprofit organizations all working to, to fund violence prevention and prioritize violence prevention as a, as a really important public health strategy. Well, I wanna thank you for taking the time to answer uh, so many questions for your incredible presentation, uh, for your interest in this topic and your uh, commitment to the field. It's, it's, uh, I feel very lucky that we get to spend time with you today. So thank you very much. I feel the same way. Thank you so much for the opportunity to talk to everybody today. And please do download our ACEs prevention resource and check out our other um, our other resources on our, our veto violence and our CDC website. Sounds great. And just a reminder, within the next day or two, we will send an email to everyone who is registered uh, with the link to a video of the presentation, uh, links to resources. We'll try to answer the questions we didn't get to today and everything else you might need. So look for that email from the Casey Foundation the next day or two. And that's it. We're going to say goodbye and hope everyone has a great day. Thanks.